This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by the Deck of Many and their amazing Big Bad Booklet series. This booklet is a monthly release that includes all the information, lore, imagery, and stat blocks that you need to run an epic boss monster in 5th edition. Available as both a digital print and play and in hard copy, this month's release features the God of Kings, a terrible entity in prison in a stone prison for their attempt to try to take over the Divine Pantheon. Every monthly release has a print and play PDF and all the reference cards that you need to role play and run an incredible epic boss battle at your game table. So check it out in the description below or head to bigbadbooklet.com to sign up now. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. This is part two of our rankings of the Paladin subclasses in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. In this episode, we are gonna be taking a look at the Paladin Oaths that were added in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which are the Oath of Redemption and the Oath of Conquest. In addition, we're going to be looking at Mythic Odysseys of Theros's Oath of Glory, as well as the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide's Oath of the Crown. The new Oath of the Watchers that was just introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has only been out for a couple weeks at the time of recording of this video, so we have chosen to omit it from the series of rankings until we can get some more experience and let the subclass percolate within the community for a little bit longer. If you look on the screen right now, you're going to see the criteria that we use to rank the subclasses. Keep in mind that we are not taking role playing into account for these subclasses as we think that all of the subclasses have an equal potential to be amazingly role played. Also, when it comes to multiclassing, we are not using that as a primary attribute to determine the rankings of these subclasses, specifically because there is one multiclass combination that is extraordinarily good for any paladin. In our last video, one of the issues that paladins have that we didn't address head on is how paladins have a big challenge allocating their ability scores. Paladins are a melee focused class that are driven towards heavy weapons or a sword and board style, which means they usually want to have a really good strength score. And because they're going to be on the front lines, they need a good constitution score. But Paladin spellcasting and so many of their other abilities is based on their charisma score. When you're building a Paladin, you have a very difficult choice to make. How high are you going to make your charisma score? And we find that it is unlikely for Paladins to have a charisma score bonus higher than plus two or plus three. And we do not assume that Paladins have a higher charisma modifier than that, unless they've decided to multi-class to Hexblade which is a very common multi-class combo for Paladins. And in our rankings of these subclasses in particular in this episode, the issue of a Hexblade multi-class came up many times. So we're addressing it right now because Kelly and I feel that the Hexblade multi-class is the rising tide that lifts all boats. It has a massive impact no matter what the Paladin subclass is. And so we've chosen to say it has an equal impact on every Paladin combo. The great thing about this multi-class is that it addresses the main concern here and allows you to focus on your charisma and constitution, making you good at spell casting while not losing anything in your damage output. And that kind of fixes one of the major problems with Paladins. Mm -hmm. Because of that, if you are looking at multi-classing as an option, the Hexblade Warlock is one of, if not the best choice for multi-classing with a Paladin of any subclass. It does have some role-playing issues, and I will say that building a Hexblade Paladin as you level up is really difficult, and you actually do run into a lot of traffic jams with when you want to pick up ability score increases and feats. So with all of that in mind, Let's take a look at the Paladin subclasses and let's get rolling. Paladins have a reputation for being great leaders, particularly on the battlefield. And while all Paladins were born to lead, some have been made to conquer. That is the Paladin of the Oath of Conquest, a ruthless battlefield commander that takes to the field 
crushing their enemies absolutely mercilessly under a military style rule of law. When you choose this oath at third level, you get the expanded spell list, which includes some standout options like hold person or spiritual weapon, as well as some higher level spells like stone skin and cloud kill that can really amplify some of the abilities of the paladin. Also at third level, the Oath of Conquest Paladin gains two channel divinity powers. The first is Guided Strike, which is very similar to the War Domain Cleric's power. You get to add a plus 10 bonus to an attack roll once using your channel divinity, allowing you to turn a missed attack into a hit. Their other power is called Conquering Presence, which allows them to send out a wave of fear against foes that are within 30 feet of them that they can see. They can choose to exclude their allies from this. Those foes have to make a wisdom saving throw or they become frightened of the paladin. These frightened foes can then repeat the saving throw at the end of their turns to end the effect. At seventh level, you gain Aura of Conquest, which has a radius of 10 feet and any creature that is frightened of you that is within the area of your aura has its speed reduced to zero. And if they start their turn within 10 feet of you, then they take damage equal to half your level in this class. At 18th level, this extends to 30 feet. At 15th level, you gain the Scornful Rebuke power. Any creature that hits you with an attack automatically takes Psychic Damage equal to your Charisma modifier with a minimum of one for every hit they make against you. At 20th level, you gain Invincible Conqueror. You can activate this ability as an action and it remains active for one minute, giving you immunity to all damage, an extra attack when you make the attack action, and you score a critical hit on a 19 or 20. I was really excited about the Oath of Conquest. I think it's a really cool and solid subclass for Paladins to consider. Getting Spiritual Weapon is a really nice pickup, and the powers and abilities offer some really potent battlefield control and damage dealing capabilities. I just don't think any of them are great. I think they're good. I think that the powers of battlefield control that the Oath of Conquest offer you, because they are based on your spell saving throw DC, which again, is not gonna be great for Paladins unless you've really invested in your charisma score, and they're also based on fear effects, which are the only thing more commonly resisted than fear is charm and poison. <laughs> so there's a lot of monsters that this just isn't going to work against them on. And while Spiritual Weapon is an awesome spell to have in your back pocket and is great for a sword and board paladin, it still isn't as good as, say, Polar Master or any other way of attacking as a bonus action. So I feel that while there are things about this that are really good, really, really solid, for me, I can't help but look at the entire package and go, okay, sure, but I could just kill the target if I was an Oath of Vengeance Paladin. So for me, I give the Oath of Conquest a B. I think it's awesome in the Hexblade multi-class scenario, but as a single class Paladin, I think it's a solid B for me. Interesting. I was a little bit more happy with the Conquest Paladin. Really? I thought that it was teetering on S tier. Okay, why? So, I think that the spell list presented is going to be really cool. There are a few standouts. It's not the best spell list, but there are some spells on there, and I love Spiritual Weapon. And I will admit that I think that sometimes there can be a bit of bias towards Polar Master. Not everybody wants to play a Polar Master Paladin. Yeah, okay. If I'm a sword and board Paladin, having an extra weapon floating around to weaponize my bonus action is great. It's, it's not only great, it's amazing. I think that there's some really nice cohesion in this class with your ability to bust out fear. I didn't consider how well resisted fear is, so that's a good point. But being able to bust out fear and then pair that with the seventh level ability to just do extra damage to people that are afraid of you nearby and lock them down. Basically, you can be near a target and be like, I'm going to kill you. And everybody else runs away while that person cowers in fear while you murder them. It's pretty epic. Not to mention their 15th and 20th level abilities, which I know don't come online until much later. But they are really good. That 20th level ability where you're just like, I'm going into combat, I'm going to just be resistant to all damage. I'm going to be able to crit way more and get an extra attack. 
that is insane for a paladin. That 20th level paladin is destroying combat encounters. Mm. The the one thing that I will say is I talked poorly about the adding 10 to one attack when it came to the war domain cleric. I do think that with a paladin who gets to pair in their smites and their smite spells, it's a little bit better because you literally get to point at the monster and be like, you're going to die now. Well, so I guess, I guess the, the Guided Strike gives you something to do in a combat encounter where the enemy is immune to fear. And you still have spiritual weapon there. And that means that, yeah, you can go sword and board, not take Polar Master, um, or do an, another weapon style build and probably be a really effective controller. And I think if you lean into that... And, like, the battlefield control is good. It is. I, I just I just think it presents a really difficult character building problem because I don't think the paladin is going to have the spell saving throw DC to I think that's going to bite this paladin in unexpected ways. So well, I can't agree with you on an S. I'm willing to concede that it's an A. I was teetering on S and you brought up some really valid points. I'm I'm easily willing to give this an A. I think it is Again, A is a very strong choice. It means that there's yeah. no no real downsides. You are going to do well playing this class. And I think the Conquest Paladin is one that speaks to what the Paladin loves doing. Yeah, and, and it is take a level of Hexblade and problem solve. Yeah. But that can't be the solution to fix every subclass. No, and uh, <laughs> even without that, the Conquest Paladin is still one of, the, one of the great choices for a Paladin subclass. At the end of the day, though, what reason is there to conquer? if not for the glory. When you select the Oath of Glory right away, you're going to get an expanded spell list like all other paladins that is going to give you some cool spells. Guiding Bolt is on here, as is Haste and Enhance Ability, as well as Freedom of Movement and Flame Strike. Pretty decent spell list overall. The Oath of Glory Paladin gains two Channel Divinity options as well at level three. The first one being Peerless Athlete, which gives you advantage on acrobatics and athletics checks, as well as being able to double the amount you can push, pull, lift, or carry, and also doubling the distance that you can jump in a long jump or high jump. This is one of the only non-combat paladin subclass abilities. It is, and that's very interesting that they went this route of bolstering ability scores and other such things instead of improving combat. The other channel divinity, Inspiring Smite, when you smite a creature, you can, as a bonus action, trigger this ability and divvy up temporary hit points equal to 2d8 plus your level amongst any number of creatures within 30 feet of you, including yourself, that you can see. At level 7, you gain the Aura of Alacrity. This aura increases your speed by 10 feet, and the aura extends out only to 5 feet around you. Creatures that start their turns within 5 feet of you have their speeds increased by 10 feet as well. It's at 18th level, the range of this aura increases to 10 feet, making it a bit of an outlier with other paladin auras, which are normally a 10 foot to start and then go out to 30 feet. This one is smaller. At level 15, you gain Glorious Defense. If an enemy attacks an ally of yours within 10 feet of you, you can use your reaction to up their AC by an amount equal to your Charisma modifier. If the attack misses and they're within range, you can then also make an attack against that creature. Then at level 20, you become a living legend. As a bonus action, you can activate several powers that persist for one minute, and you can do this once per day. While this is an effect, you have advantage on all charisma-related ability checks. Whenever you miss with an attack on your turn, you can choose to make it a hit instead, once per turn. And if you fail a saving throw, you can choose to re-roll it, but you have to use the new result. So the Oath of Glory has a few abilities that were really exciting for me. Uh, when I look at their spell list, my problem with the spell list here is I don't actually care about most of it except haste, I think, is the big addition here. Having haste for yeah. a paladin is amazing. But besides that, it seems like one of my lesser favorite spell lists. The channel divinity options, I'm going to be straight up. I, in theory, like the idea of the peerless athlete, but I see it being extremely niche and not very valuable in most circumstances. 
Being able to double the amount you can lift, carry, or push might be cool for an environmental moment in the campaign. And there is something cool to be said for a paladin that has value in those moments, but they're already going to be really strong and can already probably lift quite a bit. I don't see myself using this channel divinity very often. Some of the higher level abilities like the aura and things of that nature all are pretty limited in you having to be standing directly next to your party members. All in all, I think that there are some cool options here, and I don't think it's a bad subclass. I do think I want to give it a B because I don't find it as interesting or as universally valuable as some of the options presented in other subclasses. You know, the Oath of Glory is all about athleticism, sporting events, and all sorts of things. And I care about this subclass about as much as I care about the Olympics. Not very much. It's cool! I'll watch the Canadian hockey team play in the finals. And so I put that as the solid B. <laughs> I don't think I'm not going to reinvent my life for it. I'm not I, I don't think there's any reality where this is an A or an S tier subclass. I think you'll have fun with it. It's got some cool non-combat channel divinity powers, which is unique. Haste and enhance ability are good spells. They build on the paladin kit. You you get some things in the subclass that are roughly the equivalent to getting a feat. So there's really not a lot here. And I'm tempted to give it a C. It's not so bad as to get, get a D. Like, it, it doesn't take anything away from the Paladin. It gives you all cool things. I think the Channel Divinity power giving you the temporary for the temporary hit points is a pathetic amount of temporary hit points, especially compared to other Channel Divinity options. The main thing to keep in mind with that is it becomes less valuable the bigger your party size is. If you're trying to divvy up hit points amongst five or six characters, yeah. it's you're, they're getting like two hit points each. Even in a campaign like ours where there's only three characters, you might be able to give them nine or ten temporary hit points mm -hmm. at most. That's if you roll well on the dice. Chances are you're not going to always roll perfect on the dice, and you're actually only divvying up five or six hit points amongst a group of people. Do you think this is borderline C? The hard thing for me is when we look at C, it means that there are things that might take away from the class. This doesn't have that necessarily. But B is a subclass that in the right campaign could be A or S tier. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there is a campaign where the Oath of Glory Paladin is A or S tier. Yeah. I think it's always slightly below A tier. Like we gave the Oath of Devotion a B. And I, my reaction to the Oath of Glory is similar to the way I react to the Oath of Devotion. I think that there's a cool offensive thing, Sacred Weapon, Haste, th things like that. It feels on par with the Oath of Devotion. So I think I, I'm happy giving it a B. I'll be happy giving it a B. That's, that's what I feel like it deserves. But the thing is, with this B rating, it might be tricky to find the campaign that this one truly sings in. I think it's always going to be in the shadow of some of the other options. It's not the worst subclass. It doesn't remove anything from the Paladin, but it doesn't gain as much as some of the other options. If only there was some subclass out there that offered some sort of defensive Paladin and could redeem the Paladin class to be a good defensive player. Well, maybe that could come in the form of the Oath of Redemption in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. The Oath of Redemption is a cool duck. It really takes the pacifism and peacefulness element of the Paladin's lawful good roots and turns the volume up on that. It's not truly a pacifist character, but I think it offers some really interesting abilities. Right away when you take the Oath of Redemption at level three, you're gonna get your standard expanded spell list. And there are some cool spells on here. Most notably, you've got Sanctuary, Sleep, Hold Person, Counter Spell, Hypnotic Pattern, Autoluke's Resilient Sphere, and ultimately Wall of Force is on here. This is a pretty great list of battlefield control spells, including some of the strongest battlefield control spells in the game. 
As always, you get two channel divinity options also when you choose this oath at third level. The first one being Emissary of Peace, which allows you as a bonus action to add plus five to any persuasion checks that you are making. The second of which is Rebuke the Violent. When an attack is made against a creature within 30 feet of you, you can choose to make that attacking creature force them to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail the saving throw, they take radiant damage equal to the damage they were about to output, and on a successful save, they take half as much. At level 7, you gain the Aura of the Guardian. When a creature within 10 feet of you in the area of the aura takes damage, you can use your reaction to magically take that damage instead. You suffer all the damage. There's no way that you can prevent that damage from happening at all, and the creature doesn't take any. At level 18, the aura extends out to 30 feet, but you still have to use your reaction to take the damage from one of the creatures within it. At 15th level, you gain Protective Spirit. If you are below half hit points at the start of your turn in combat, you get to regain 1d6 plus half your level in hit points. This doesn't work if you're incapacitated. At level 20, instead of getting a power you can activate, you gain the Emissary of Redemption power which is always on. You have resistance to the damage dealt by other creatures, and when creatures do deal damage to you, they take radiant damage equal to half the damage they dealt. There's a caveat, however. While this ability is always on, as soon as you damage an enemy creature with an attack, or cast a spell on them, or otherwise harm them, these benefits end for that creature. So let's get into it. The Redemption Paladin symbolizes the defensive paladin who is protecting the party. And I think it actually does a really excellent job at this. First of all, if we look at something like the simple addition of counterspell into the spell list, this spell saves lives and putting it on a paladin who's at the foreground, sees an enemy wizard about to cast Cone of Cold and knock out the whole party, they can counterspell that. It's brilliant. I love the counterspell is here. I love the fact that the Oath of Redemption Paladin can just bounce damage back onto an enemy. If, if your ally is about to get hit with major damage, they still might take that damage, but you can just be like, you're taking it too, bud, and that's gonna change the battle for that one moment. Not only that, but I think it's brilliant that the level seven and 15 ability pair really nicely together. Mm. At level seven, you're going to be able to absorb damage for your teammates. And then once you reach level 15, it's less of an issue for you because you can regain hit points yourself. So you get this really nice cohesion of being a really good protector who's not afraid to take on that damage. You can stand in the front lines and with that 20th level ability, you can literally stand there and help out your party and take hits, damaging your opponents in the process. I actually think that as far as a defensive paladin, the Redemption Paladin is one of the best, and I'm willing to give it a strong A. I agree. I think it's a total A. Uh, I think that it has some great protective features that really let you succeed at protecting your party members while staying alive doing it. The fact that you heal up yourself is really critical for this, although there's going to be this very long period between level 7 and level 15 where you don't have that self-healing. Fortunately, paladins are tough. You have lay on hands, you have lots of tools that you can heal yourself up, but you might not be making as many attacks as you want to. Having counterspell is totally clutch on a paladin. Um, you're gonna have to roll to counterspell that cone of cold though. Um, and so the other thing as well is that with spells like sleep, they don't scale. Hypnotic Pattern, again, you run into the same problem the Conquest Paladin has, where you're not quite going to have that excellent spell saving throw DC. Again, unless you play this as a spellcaster. And I see the argument for playing an Oath of Redemption Paladin as a charisma-based character and not worrying about your combat skills. I still kind of think you need to be able to fight. Yeah, but I do think that this almost gains something from plus five charisma, plus mm. two or three strength. Yeah. And could still work. And, and like, let's, let's not mince any words here. You are not a pacifist 
if you are helping other people beat people up. (laughs) Right? Just because you're not doing any damage, but you're helping people that are, that you're not a pacifist in that case. You're just an accomplice. (laughs) The pacifism thing doesn't really hold water here. You're just not the one stabbing the knife. I think that for a, a person that does want to play a defensive supportive character that does want to de-escalate from violence and wants to look at violence only as a last resort, I think that this is an excellent realization of that concept. I don't necessarily think it's the strongest path to, to victory in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, but it makes a really compelling argument for it, and I'm happy to give this subclass an A. Finally, we come to the Oath of the Crown, introduced in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. The Oath of the Crown is an oath of service to a righteous ruler, hopefully. (laughs) And when you take this oath right away at third level, you're going to get a pretty interesting spell list. The spells include Compelled Duel, Warding Bond, Spirit Guardians, Banishment, and finally Circle of Power. A pretty decent spell list, and a paladin with spirit guardians is really compelling to me. Again, you have two channel divinity options when you choose this at third level. The first one being Champion's Challenge. Champion Challenge allows you to target any number of creatures within 30 feet of you, and they have to make a wisdom saving throw, being compelled to fight you. If they fail the saving throw, then they cannot move more than 30 feet away from you. The second option is Turn the Tide. You choose a number of creatures within 30 feet of you and they regain hit points equal to 1d6 plus your Charisma modifier. In order for them to regain hit points, they need to have half or less of their total hit points. At level 7, they gain the Divine Allegiance power. When a creature within 5 feet of them takes damage, they can use their reaction to take that damage instead. Quite similar to the Oath of Redemption power, but it is only within 5 feet. And unlike other Paladin Auras, its range does not increase at level 18. At level 15, you gain Unyielding Spirit, which gives you advantage on saving throw against being paralyzed or stunned. At level 20, you become an Exalted Champion, and as an action, you can activate several powers that, quite notably, instead of lasting for one minute, unlike the other Paladin Capstones, these last for one hour. You get resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons. Allies within 30 feet of you have advantage on death saving throws, and you and allies within 30 feet of you also gain advantage on wisdom saving throws. You can use this power once per day, but it ends if you become incapacitated. So did the Oath of Redemption just eat the Oath of the Crown's lunch? That's the biggest point against the Oath of the Crown, is that its level seven ability is literally the same as the Oath of Redemption's level 7 ability, but worse. And its channel divinity power that forces everybody to stay within 30 feet of you, it doesn't actually force them to attack you. It just says they can't get more than 30 feet away from you, so they can still smash your friends. And in addition to that, the Oath of Conquest's power is flat out better because it frightens enemies, which means they can't come closer to you and they have disadvantage on their attack rolls, or they just get frozen solid in place if they're within your other aura. So it's weaker than the conquest and it's weaker than the, than the redemption. The only thing going for the Oath of the Crown here is Spirit Guardians. I was gonna say the same thing. It has Spirit Guardians and that's amazing. I love the idea of Spirit Guardians on a Paladin. Why did it have to be on the Oath of the Crown? Even even at level 20, gaining, gaining Uh, resistance to piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks at level 20 is again, it's like minions won't hurt you. Okay, cool. They probably weren't doing much to you anyway at this level. And the the advantage on saving throws against being stunned or paralyzed is great, but a fifth, like, you gotta look at the saving throw modifiers for a 15th level paladin. They're off the chain, right? Because High-level paladins are adding their charisma modifier to everything. Like, I've routinely seen paladins with saving throw modifiers of plus 12 or higher. And the no matter what kind of paladin you're playing, it, it is very easy for you to make your saving throws. And so while being incapacitated by being stunned or paralyzed is really, really bad, advantage is, a, is valuable but not 
that valuable. I, I feel like for a 15th level ability, when you look at that one, it's not. it doesn't excite me the way that the 15th level abilities do on almost every other paladin. Does this take away anything from the paladin? That is my one argument, is I still don't think there is a D-tier ranked paladin subclass. No, I don't, I don't think there is either. I agree. This, I think, I, I'd be willing to give this a C because it doesn't take away from the paladin in any way. Yeah. It just doesn't add as much as any of the other subclasses. It is, you should go for redemption or conquest if anything in the subclass appeals to you, I think. I, I, I really think that with the Oath of the Crown, it just, it feels half-baked. Both redemption and conquest present two really cool takes on a defensive battlefield control paladin. And they do it pretty well. They blow the Oath of the Crown out of the water in that respect. And that's the thing. Now, my favorite thing about the Oath of the Crown is the roleplay. We're not judging it on roleplay, which is why it's getting a C. But if you wanted to, conquest or redemption could both be issued by a lord, mm -hmm. king, queen, what have you. And you could simply roleplay any paladin yeah. to be the emissary of a crown and get a better paladin out of it. I love the idea of getting spirit guardians on a paladin, although with Tasha's bringing us spirit shroud, we get something cool instead that it didn't actually make it into all paladin spell lists. So there's still an option there for, for something that's slightly similar in terms of, terms of a damage, but not as good. And, and certainly getting spirit guardians raises the stock. Just it's enough to keep it out of the D tier entirely. Yeah. So up on screen right now, you are going to see our final rankings for all of the Paladin subclasses that we have reviewed so far. Let's take a look at what the community thought of these Paladin subclasses and how they stack up. Oath of Conquest kicks things off with 30% of respondents giving it an S tier ranking, 46% giving it an A tier ranking, and about 19% giving it a B tier ranking with the remainder falling in the lower ranks. People love the Oath of Conquest. I think it's safe to say that it's a very strong A choice. It, it is, absolutely. And I think of the other Paladin subclasses, only the Oath of Vengeance got a more positive response. The Oath of Redemption is pushing 11% for S tier, with 28% A tier and 40% B tier, with 16% C and a little bit for the D tier. It's actually a pretty widespread, a lot of different opinions on the Oath of Redemption. I think it's interesting that it lands here in the B tier, but I think, I think it's a strong choice. I agree. I think it's really strong, and I would love to know what disappoints people about it. The Oath of Glory received a similar lukewarm response, however. Only 6.2% gave it an S tier ranking, 24% giving it an A tier ranking, 46 a B and 18% a C. I think that lukewarm response mirrors our own lukewarm response to it. It feels like it's decent. It doesn't take away, away anything for the, from the Paladin, but it's a very middle ground oath. With the Oath of the Crown, we are looking at 19% A, 44% B, and 26% C, with only a small sliver for both S and D tier rankings. This lands very much in the middle, but actually leaning towards the lower end, more so than the higher end. Yes, conclusively, the Oath of the Crown got the lowest rankings from our community poll overall, with the most B and C tier rankings of any of the other Paladin subclasses. So this is a final look at what our community ranked uh, the Paladins overall. A bunch of classes on the A tier and a bunch of classes on the B tier. <laughs> so just like we did last time, we I think we'll show very briefly here on screen the second highest rated class from each of the community, just to see what the spread is with a little bit more diversity there. Again, I think it by separating the Paladins out a little bit more, it helps us see a clear picture of which subclasses the community responds to quite strongly and which ones were not as well received by the community. I think overall, again, the Paladin is a strong class and all the subclasses presented are either good to excellent. 
And I think that's a really strong thing to look at here is that paladins are remarkable. They're a great class in the game of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. And if you're into the idea of playing a paladin, no matter what subclass you choose, you're going to have something to do that's fun. There are some standout options in the subclasses though. This is very true. The paladin base class is so formidable that the paladin subclasses really are a difference of are they kind of nice or are they keying off on something that paladins are already amazing at. The subclasses that Kelly and I really love, like the Oath of Vengeance, are so powerful because they combine with so many other game elements to produce one of the strongest damage dealers in the entire game. And that deserves to be recognized. But any paladin is capable of some fantastic damage output, as well as some very, very solid defense. Not to mention, you get to sample spell casting as well. So really, this hits all the notes of Dungeons & Dragons in one class. So this has been a look at our tier rankings for the Paladin subclasses in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played a Paladin, tell us about your favorite subclass option in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. You can find out more about our community by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all of the previous episodes of that show right up over here. And we've got plenty more videos ranking the various classes and subclasses in D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.